Following the chaos of the Russian Revolution and the Russian Civil War, the country was gripped by a truly disturbing famine. As many as 5 to 10 million people starved to death or succumbed to the diseases that ran rampant amongst the emaciated population. In acts of bitter desperation, many turned to consuming the flesh of others, including their own family members. In today's video, we will cover the causes of the famine, the grim reality for those affected, and the relief efforts that finally brought it to an end. It is perhaps helpful to start with the situation in Russia as of 1920. Tsarist Russia had been defeated in the First World War, with more than 2 million soldiers killed and almost 5 million wounded. The war led to mass starvation and a revolution that brought the Marxist Bolsheviks under Vladimir Lenin to power. This in turn triggered a civil war that claimed a further 3 million Russian lives and plunged the country into further chaos. For example, as much as 80% of the country's railway were out of commission, making it much harder to get the food where it needed to be. Even before the famine of 1921, people in both the city and the countryside were starving. As many as 64 million people were affected between 1918 and 1920. As for the communist Bolshevik Red Army and the royalist and international white armies fought the civil war, grain and food was confiscated to feed the troops. This was often done without giving the farmers any form of compensation. Food taken by the communist Red Army was done with little to no regard for local needs. Stores were emptied whilst seed grains vital for next year's crop production were depleted. Between the loss of manpower to toil the fields and disastrous droughts in 1920 and 1921, crop yields were decimated. Around 25% of crops died before harvest. Rainfall was less than 1% as what might be expected. All of this resulted in a crop less than half of what would be achieved before the First World War. What's more, many of the peasant farm labourers greatly distrusted the communist Bolsheviks. Many saw them as a party for the workers of the cities and not for those in the countryside. The Bolsheviks claimed a monopoly on the food production in Russia and sought to restrict the purchase of food by individual workers from peasants. Food sales were to be controlled by the Bolsheviks and the free market replaced with a controlled one. Priority was given to providing food for workers in the city as the Bolsheviks sought to create an industrial powerhouse and to grow a strong working class. Landowning peasants who were successful were called kulaks and kulaks were accused of causing the shortage. They were accused of withholding grain in an attempt to drive up prices or in a counter-revolutionary act of defiance. Bolshevik policies of control also resulted in peasants choosing to grow less crops and rear fewer animals, unwilling to sell their produce for less than what they could get otherwise. In the end, the Bolsheviks organised food armies to carry out mass requisitions of food to feed the workers of the cities. As much as 90% of a region's food would be taken, and would be taken by force. As the famine took hold, many in the countryside moved into the cities in hopes of better pay and better access to food again robbing the manpower to actually produce food. But many of these people waited in vain at train stations or steamer boat ports, hoping to reach the cities. However, many would die during the journey. With such a lack of food, people began to turn to consume famine foods. Tree bark, moss, weeds, acorns, dead animals, anything that could be scavenged from the countryside was eaten. Some people even turned to eating clay the straw from the roofs of their homes, and even manure. Any pets, such as cats and dogs, as well as valuable working animals like horses, were all butchered for their meat. With such poor diets, many children were left with distended bellies and skeletal frames. In some instances, the starving were advised by the government officials to create a bone meal made from the excavated bones from animals. The consumption of such foodstuffs only offered limited nutritional value whilst exposing already ill people to disease. Typhus, cholera and dysentery ran rampant, yet this would be far from the most disturbing food consumed. Many people engaged in cannibalism during the famine, however the full extent of the cannibalism is not known. In the Volga River Basin, an area badly affected by the famine, cannibalism was rife. There are accounts of fleshy dead bodies being exhumed from graves to be eaten, 
In some instances, grieving widows would refuse to hand over the bodies of their deceased husbands, as the husband's body would be used to feed the family. There are grim accounts of children perishing, their bodies gnawed upon by their siblings in desperation to survive. Rumours abounded, both in the countryside and the cities, of butchers selling human meat. As many as ten such butcher shops were closed for selling human meat. Now, there are truly disturbing photographs readily available on the internet for what are dubbed meat markets. But be warned, they are incredibly graphic and beyond comprehension. In the photographs, you can see adults stood above the remains of children, and the remains are all laid out on a table. These body parts were reportedly sold. In another picture, a group of peasants can be seen standing over the remains of people they had eaten, seemingly photographed in evidence of their crime. And in perhaps the most haunting of photographs, a young Ukrainian boy sits in a bathtub. His thousand-yard stare says it all. He had killed and eaten his three-year-old brother. Desperation then led to euthanasia of the ill to provide those still clinging to life a meal. But in grim examples, parents would kill their own child in order to feed their others. There are even accounts of unaccompanied children stolen from the streets and then consumed by their kidnappers. According to one relief worker, cannibalism was part of general conversation. Quote, Families were killing and devouring fathers, grandfathers and children. Ghastly rumours about sausages prepared with human corpses were common. In the markets, one heard threats to make sausages of a person. It should be reminded that some of the accounts may have been exaggerated, one example being that of an American relief worker by the name of William Shafforth, who was incorrectly reported as being cannibalised by the people he sought to help. Some accounts were exaggerated in order to paint the communist Bolsheviks as monsters, but cannibalism was a real and grim reality of the famine. Where caught, cannibals were often executed outright or detained for fear of the local population carrying out vigilante justice. The death toll was massive and death became a daily occurrence. It reached the point that mass graves were dug in advance by the weary and starved, well aware that they would not have the strength to dig their own graves later. Death became so common that it was seen as suspicious if a family had not suffered a death. It was seen as proof that they were hoarding food and were at risk of being raided. Criminality surged, either through desperation or exploiting the grim situation. Bandits sought to steal. People were murdered over scraps of food. Bands of orphaned children roamed the countryside, doing whatever they could to survive. It was not uncommon for parents to abandon their children, unable to watch them starve or simply just unable to take care of them. Orphanages were overcrowded and were infested with lice and typhus. With millions starving and suffering, the Bolsheviks eventually agreed to accept foreign aid to assist with the famine. They were initially fearful of foreign intervention. Many countries who offered help had backed the Tsarist White Army against them during the Civil War, and they feared that capitalist countries may disrupt their Marxist project. In countries like the UK, many were opposed to helping the Bolsheviks, as these were the very people who had massacred the Russian royal family and were seen as an enemy. The focus groups, like the British Save the Children, was able to raise funds to feed starving children, largely seen as innocents. They raised over half a million pound, set up over 1,400 kitchens and fed over 300,000 children. In one Russian town, British and American Quakers ran a relief mission that fed not only just children, but families as well. However, the organisation perhaps most responsible for feeding those affected by the famine was the American Relief Administration. Headed by future President Herbert Hoover, he had already proven his ability in delivering food aid to Belgium after the First World War. Americans too were fearful of the Bolsheviks, with communist agitation in the United States beginning to rise. Again, plenty believed that feeding the Russians was against their interests, only helping their adversary. The ARA was founded in 1921, following appeals from the Bolshevik government and prominent Russians. The organization was headed by Colonel William Haxel. Over $21 million of surplus American grain, produce and seeds were brought by the United States government, 
$7 million worth of private donations from American citizens helped fund this massive operation. Boats carrying hundreds of tons of aid arrived at the ports of Petrograd. The goal initially was to feed as many children as possible. On the menu was bread, cocoa, rice, condensed milk and sugar, and millions were inoculated against typhoid. By the end of the program, some 19,000 kitchens had been opened, feeding millions every single day. Realising the scale of the problem, adults too were supported and fed. The ARA, however, was not trusted by the Bolshevik regime. The secret police infiltrated the organisation to make sure that they were not spreading dissent or arming any rebels. There can be no doubt that the ARA hoped to show the Russians that their new government was ineffectual, hoping to prove that the Bolsheviks did not have the answer to their problems. Yet they would seek to achieve this through charitable acts, not through spreading dissent or encouraging violence. By 1923, better harvest started to bring the famine to an end. With relief from the ARA and others, millions of lives were saved. It got to the point where the Bolsheviks commenced the export of grain to pay off Russian war debts, and in return, the ARA withdrew. It should be noted though, that for many regions such as the Volga River Basin, the famine did not end fully until 1925, but the worst of the famine was finally over. The grim reality of famine is an all too common story. Man-made factors exacerbated by a failed harvesting inflicted misery on millions. For the Russian famine, it was a tragedy after successive turmoil. The failings of the Bolshevik government and the relief effort that saved millions of lives ought to never be forgotten, nor should those who endured the horrors of one of the deadliest famines.